sense. It's the PTSD, man. I can't help it. I'm excited. Oh, so, yeah. It's a crappy team against the Titans. Everybody has this as a win. And it's just like, I, I have it as a win too, but part of me is still scared. Like, damn it. Is that is that bad? No. I made a pretty significant bet today about – and it's not, I, I, I still it. have the Bears to, to win, but I do have the Titans covering um, plus four and a half. I know you're not much of a gambler, but to basically you know lay that out for you, it's that the Titans, even if they lose, will only lose by less than five points. Gotcha. I, they're basically saying there's no chance that the Bears win like 27-20. I don't see them winning by a full touchdown. I have the Titans covering. I have the bear. I have the over 45, 44 and a half. Yeah. So a 24 to 21 point lead or a game bears winning. It would win me quite a chunk, chunk of change, but I think you just gave your prediction out there. <laughs> Low key. Bears I did 24, 21, according to David, right? Yeah. Let's get to this then. So okay. I've been doing a lot in the last two days of like just analyzing the Titans. I've been doing all my deep dive on the Titans just to cut. Kind of, I have no feel for this team as of a week ago. And so I said, you know, I, I have to figure out what the hell this team is. The, the things I've gathered is that I think this team is in a little bit more of a rebuild than they wanted to lead on. The majority of that is the, they're filling some pieces in with veterans that are over the hill or, just kind of stopgap measures um, to figure out if Will Levis is actually an NFL quarterback. Um, the, thing, the thing they have going for them, though, on the offense is the offensive line. Exactly. Which makes it a lot easier for a guy like Will Levis to sit there and go out and have good days. Tony Pollard's not a bad running back either. Like, he's, he's all right. You know what I mean? So... I mean, if you feel like commenting on the whole situation, feel free and interrupt me, but I'll, I'll give you how I looked at this game breakdown wise. So looking at their roster, I think the matchup is much closer. The The fact that people are penciling in this win, if I had zero emotional investment in this game, I honest to God would be taking Tennessee right now on money line. I can't bring myself to doing that. The but last you know time it. I... But the last time I <laughs> the last time I predicted a loss, I was right with Green Bay with an opener. Um, you know what the record for first overall pick quarterbacks is? Last oh and twelve. Year? Oh and 14, oh, 14 and one. One tie. Oh, okay. I mean, that's just yeah. Yeah. Kind of relevant, yeah. But um, no, I know. But but it's still his. Like, no, I, I history's not on our side with that in the analytic, and it's very drastically one way. So. If you look at the way this team lines up, um, they have a rookie nose tackle. And then funny enough, do you know who that is? It's Tavondre Sweat, guy that we liked out of Texas. He probably got drafted a little bit too high. But Tavondre Sweat is going to be starting their nose tackle. Um, they don't have like absolute bums on either side. Sebastian Joseph Day, I believe he was like a full 17-game starter last year. Jeffrey Simmons, um, Pro Bowler, absolute beast. Talking a lot of shit this summer about Caleb already. So he's going to be kind of pumped up on, on the defensive line. Let's hope the Bears' offensive line is good enough or ready enough to handle him. The other side, the linebackers are... They got Legereus Sneed, too, from the Chiefs, didn't they? They did. And so their their linebackers are not bums. Um, but they have Harold Landry, Ernest Jones, Kenneth Murray. And Chido Bay Awuzie was the starting quarterback on the, on the Bengals. And I believe they were ready to go into this season with that guy, basically their number one cornerback. And Legereus Sneed just kind of popped up out of nowhere. And, you know, that turned into their second cornerback, who's, again, pretty damn good. Quandre Diggs as their free safety. I believe that's a Seattle kind of rollover. So he was not like a bum. He's definitely on the smaller side. He's on the older side. He's 31 now, but he is an NFL former Pro Bowl safety Kind of one of those sneaky free safeties that might bait and switch Caleb like a rookie into some sort of stupid mistake. Amani Hooker um, with Jamal Adams as a backup. Amani Hooker, same thing. Not a bum. Yep. Uh, 26 year old. He's uh, quick, fast. Not you know whatever. It's he's a good player. He's a fourth round pick. Uh, 2019 uh, full. I think he's like a full 17 games. 
basically what we're saying is like the defense is not a slouch and that's basically where they match up really well. So for offensive game plan, I heavily believe that even more so DeAndre Swift, DeAndre Swift, DeAndre Swift. Um, I was going to say the same thing. You, you're going to have to run the ball. You got to run the ball and get the ball out of Caleb's hands, man. First few weeks, especially that was kind of the game plan that they presented to the team, to the, to the fans, to the media. They presented that they were just going to, you know, basically, Hey, you don't, it's not a Ferrari right now. You're just kind of, you're, you're running in like second and third gear. You're not shifting up yet. You know, just kind of hand the ball off, dump the ball off, let your playmakers make plays. And then eventually in the season, once you get your feet wet, that's when you can kind of come out of nowhere and start making the plays. So that's got to be the game plan. Um, yeah, I mean, the strength of our team early on has to be the defense. So, like, you're right. Defense don't lean on, the ball, you know, yeah. you shouldn't, shouldn't have to lean on Caleb in week one. And I know you said that very early on in episodes ago. You were like, if you have to lean on Caleb in week one, that's a problem. So, That's a bigger yeah. team-wide problem, yeah, exactly. 100%. We're realizing with this training camp and this hard knocks is for people like us who are much more realistic, have them at like nine wins versus, you know, like 11, the 11, 12, 13 yeah. people, you know. It's a very unfinished roster. And so we're going to see some imperfections here. Every team has that, you know, we're like, everybody's sitting there going like, oh man, if we let go of Reddy Stewart, he's going to be gone. It's nonsense because every team's got that ready Stewart, you know, every team's got that training camp guy that competes and everybody loves and everybody thinks that they're going to get picked up by another team. Um, but unless a team's sixth receiver is better than your fourth receiver, probably not going to happen. And even then you're doing it so late in the year, you don't want to learn a new offense and stuff like that. So we've had this conversation when, um, when it comes to the roster on this team, and we primarily had it in the form of talking about the defensive end position and how that's still a need. And we've tossed around different conversations between ourselves, Micah Parsons being one of them. You know, I kept coming back with the thought that, like, we're not where the 49ers are at. We're not, we're not there. Like, we can't sit there and afford to give up so much draft capital for one guy because if it fails – it still really, really hurts us. Whereas like the 49ers, I mean, you could debatably argue that the reason why they don't have a Super Bowl is because they did take a lot of draft capital, trade up for Trey Lance, and it got them absolutely nothing, right? Like if that was any kind of impact player or two even, um, you, you know, you could maybe argue a case for them actually going all the way and getting a ring. That might have hurt them without us actually seeing it per se. But uh, what I'm saying is that they still – even with that kind of mistake, are a playoff team, are a very complete roster. You know, they're able to sit there and then go ahead and package more draft capital to trade for Christian McCaffrey. And, you know, they're able to afford to do that stuff because they are very deep. And not saying that it might not catch up with them, because it might. I think pretty soon that team is going to be in an interesting situation financially and everything like that. But, you know, you look at another team like the Eagles, where they're just stacked top to bottom. And, you know, you feel like you've earned the right to kind of make some of these gambles and some of these moves. And I just don't feel the Bears are quite there yet. I think we are in a much better position than we're used to as fans. But that doesn't mean that when you compare it to the rest of the NFL that we're in necessarily a great position, right? I think that last sentence you said probably summarized it the best, right? Is that – and I almost couldn't even put that to words until you just kind of said it where – we're as Bears fans really, really excited about this team and this roster. And we're like, oh man, they might be really, really good. But I don't think any other than maybe like receiver, right? You're you're that group of players. I don't think you envy any position on this team if you're like an elite level play, like elite level playoff team, right? I don't think the Niners are going like, man, if only we had the Bears defensive line, or if we had the Bears defensive backs, or if we like, yeah, they're they're good. You know, until this year, and they prove it, like Tyreek Stevenson, Kyler Gordon, and they have like some sort of crazy, crazy year. I don't think any team that's uh, an elite level playoff team is going like, man, if only we just had this from the Bears, then, you know. So I think, like you said, we're a year, we're still a year away. We've been saying this for a while, me and you. Um, we're like exactly one year away. And the thing that's frustrating with the Micah Parsons move is – we said this when Montez Sweat got traded. Defensive ends are very rare to move from teams. They're kind of like quarterbacks. When you get a good quarterback, they stick around for 10 years minimum. 
think when you get a good defensive end, it's very rare for them to be moved on from or traded unless you have something like a Washington situation where it's like, oh, we have so many guys we need to pay. Um, we got to figure out a place to get rid of Montez Sweat or Chase Young or whoever. Ever since Matt Judon, I've kind of had this thought process about Ryan Poles and this is going to sound like not liking Ryan Poles. I love Ryan Poles. Um, the one criticism I would have of Ryan Poles is sometimes he needs to be saved from himself, right? And we've talked about that as well. Uh, Mike McGlinchey was his big uh, two, a year ago contract basically was swept out from under him by the Broncos, thankfully, well, right? What was that linebacker that went to the Steelers? Linebacker. That, or um, Yeah, that he fell to physical. That would be not a linebacker. It was a defensive tackle. It was there you go. Uh, a defensive tackle. He had a very interesting name. He was from the Cincinnati Bengals. Now he's on the Pittsburgh Steelers, and he's doing pretty well. It was Larry Ogunjobi. And so Larry Ogunjobi would have been his big first three-tech uh, signing, right? Yeah, but when he went to the Steelers, he signed for a lot less. <laughs> a lot less. So, uh, sometimes Ryan Poles needs to be safe from himself, right? And... And then I think this year, depending on how we want to believe what we've seen in like hard knocks and that Ryan Poles was offering Saquon a lot of money. And the Eagles beat him out for that. We say all these value things, value things, value things. Um, paying a top five right tackle in the league for bottom 20 production, not that great of a value. Um, high, trying to sign a defensive tackle um, that was so hurt that he failed a physical, not value. And then now Saquon Barkley for a max deal, not a great value. So he kind of preaches these certain things and he doesn't necessarily, I don't know. Sometimes, like I said, he's, he has to be safe from himself with these excitement things. And then in my opinion, I think Matt Judon, if you had signed him for a third round pick and paid him like 20 mil a year um, for a 32 year old pass rusher might've not been the best, valuable thing to do with a third round pick. And so what I'm saying is I know you right mentioned now, I know you mentioned also kind of missing out on Brian Burns to me a lot. Yeah, Brian Burns keeps me up at night personally because when you see what Ryan Poles is now willing to do for a player of that kind of caliber and that kind of stature, when you see Matthew Matthew Judon at 32 traded for a third in my mind, when Brian Burns goes for a second and a fifth, if I'm not mistaken, and I want to double check that trade, Brian Burns trade. Um, I believe that, you're right. That to me is an insane, for a 26-year-old, really, who just needed to get paid. Uh, Ryan Poles clearly liked Brian Burns. He tried to include him in the first time he went to Carolina, and he tried to give him that. The only justification I would say that we'll never know the answer to is, was Carolina so damaged by Ryan Poles' trading of them that they would never do a deal with the Bears again? Um, however, I find that hard to believe because if you had said to Ryan Poles, like, hey, give us our second round pick back next year. We know it's going to be like a top 33, 35 pick and give us your third or maybe your fourth this year. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, Brian Burns keeps me up at night. And that one kind of like, if he had the opportunity to do that, and maybe he was too a little bit high on himself lately where he did not pull a trigger on a Byron Burns trade, I, I think that's going to be a problem. And so now you look at it, and now we're talking about Trey Hendrickson for a second. We're talking about Matthew Judon for a third. Uh, we're talking about, I don't know who's going to be available. Micah Parsons, I mean, that starts at Khalil Mack, right? Uh, yeah. Um, I know a guy you mentioned before too, Cameron Jordan, might be the actual realistic move here. And to me, that's why I'm I'm going to be watching uh, New Orleans really closely this year from the perspective of I really hope they suck because that team is ready to be stripped apart for, for like, gutted for parts. And I think Cam Jordan's, like, target number one. I don't really know who else makes a lot of money on that team, but that cap situation is an absolute travesty. I think Derek Carr is expensive. I'm pretty sure Taysom Hill is expensive for some reason. We're just going to see how this season plays out. And we are a year away, like we say, but so you don't really need to do anything drastic in my opinion. But if you start off like on the positive end, four and two, right? Um, five and two, four and three, 
you probably are looking at that like, man, I think we might have something here because if you're doing that without that second defensive end, I do think that a second defensive end puts you over the top, probably puts you in playoff contention or even like somebody like Hassan Reddick. If the jets are just like, you know what? We traded him for a second. You can give us a third. We'll take a little bit of a loss and we'll get him out of our hair. So as long as the bears are willing to pay him, just looking at the schedule as a whole, we talked about the people that are predicting 11, 12, 13 wins. And it's like, yeah, because it's so easy to predict, which lets you know it's th – dude, that's the NFL. It's not easy, right? So there's going to be trap games. There's going to be trap games. And it could start off right away being a trap game against the, the Tennessee Titans. And like you said, our biggest concern will be very obvious in week one, whether Matt Eberflus and this coaching staff has this team ready to go a hot start is so important here because, like I said, you cannot sit there and just repeat the same mistakes over and over. And one of the big mistakes last year was going 0-4. That just mm -hmm. it killed you. It really killed you. And you have a pretty tough matchup against Houston in Week 2. I said the same line last year. It's Week 1, and it's already a must-win game. <laughs> mm -hmm. and and I've that's heard why that we all, on multiple podcasts, that's, and it's funny that you say really, that. Yeah, no, mm -hmm. I said it last year. I'm going to say it again this year because it's every year, man. This is the NFL. This is how it is. It's just – it's tough, man. Every week's a damn mu must-win week. Like, But, yeah, you got to come out ready to go. You cannot come out I mean, slow and, and not come away with a victory against this team. I mean, that would be so deflating, as deflating as last year's week one loss to the Packers. If not – I would I mean, argue it would be Maybe worse. more. Yeah, maybe more. Exactly. And so you just can't have this fan base live through that again. I mean, they not only that, Paulie, you know, but like we, we, you've, you've been preaching this more than anyone I've ever heard. You, it's all about a, a decent start this year. And like we said, Iberflus isn't on the hot seat necessarily, even if you go like, you know, one and three or something like that. I don't think. But I mean, what the hell else are you supposed to do? Right, that would be like, so you, rough, man. You got to stay around five hundred. You do so, but I mean, quickly. Everybody's got, and the big one of my biggest like paranoias about this week and this game is that everybody has it penciled in as a win, and I just hope that everybody's right rather than it being hype. Because every year, Mitch Trubisky, number one vote for MVP in Vegas, Justin Fields, number one vote, you know, bet in uh, in Vegas for MVP. The Bears always. It's one of the best fan bases. It's one of the most hype fan bases, and we're always ready to just kind of crown them for anything that we see that's mediocre to decent but you look at the schedule really quickly and you're scared of 0-4 last year and how it ruined the whole season Tennessee if you don't win you're probably not winning against the Texans I would say that's like a 95 percenter it's probably one of the few games that you can pencil in as a guaranteed loss then you have the Colts who knows but they might be good if everybody is predicting them they won nine games with uh Gardner Minshew so it's not a bum team either. And then you got the Rams week four, depending on how well these teams start and who starts off bad, you have a zero and four start staring you in the face, one and three start staring you in the face again. And if that doesn't put you on the hot seat, I don't know what's going to put you on the hot seat. And here I am making like hype videos nightly, <laughs> like every yeah. night, hype, hype, hype. So it just is what it is, right? Um, yeah, I, we don't. We're not Debbie Downers. We're dude. We're so we're so excited. We want to start like four and zero, but it's just not we've realistic. Seen, we've lived through moments where it just hasn't happened, though. So, yeah. this is what, and I keep saying this all off season too. I'm gonna live and die by this damn phrase. I, I'm tired of saying I want changes. I want to see changes. Like you, you keep preaching change. Okay, then. Come out, start hot. Let's go beat the Packers this year. Like, these things need to happen to me, and it's more important than, like, the, the season total wins. It really is. Like I said, I, I have at nine wins, but I haven't getting there in the best way possible for me to be mm -hmm. as happy as I could possibly be. And I go back to the impact of a quarterback, everybody. Yeah, even everything the best is lined coaches, up for you, man. We're even just, just the start. best coaches, Andy Reid, it still took him 20 years to win one. And it wasn't until he got Patrick Mahomes that he won one. We look at Tom Brady. You know, Bill Belichick's known as the greatest head coach. Second Tom Brady leaves. Doesn't win one again. 
it's just, man, coaching can do so much for you if it's amazing. And I know we don't have tier one coaching <laughs> talent right here. I th This has got to be the year of Caleb. And my God, if he is anything as advertised, David, he will carry this thing. I mean, can you tell how, how PTSD we are? How scarred we are? No, this is normal to me. This is like the daily. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure everybody else can tell. Uh, this No, this, this, this is just, uh, I'm fucked, man. I need this to work, man. <laughs> yeah. I need I think, it. 